kind of Ryan versus Henry. Each side will have 20 minutes to present or uh, argument upon. You may reserve any amount of time that you wish for rebuttal, but you have to keep track of it that time yourself. We have a clock at the podium for you to uh, watch the time and act accordingly. We are re- 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 recording the argument both in audio and v- v- video. We're live streaming, I believe, and the argument will be on uh, YouTube soon. So if you want to watch yourself, you're uh, able to. Because we're doing that, though, please uh, identify yourself and your client when you step up to the podium so that we can keep everybody straight. We've read the briefs and examined the record and conference the case, so we're f- familiar with the, the facts and the law. So when you begin your argument, just begin with what you would like to talk with us about. Counsel, you may begin. May it please the court. Jesse Callahan with May Potenza, Baron and Gillespie, on behalf of plaintiff appellant Nolan Ryan. This case presents an interesting set of facts because Nolan Ryan is a judgment creditor. He is the first named judgment creditor. He is the first named plaintiff. And under this judgment, he is owed $600,000. The co-judgment creditors, two of them, Mark Hale and Tim Hammer, without informing Nolan Ryan, without asking for his consent, and most importantly, without joining him to the garnishment proceeding, filed an application for a writ of garnishment against the judgment debtor. It tied up $300,000, and Hammer and Hale take the position that Nolan Ryan was not an indispensable party, that the rules of civil procedure do not apply to these garnishment proceedings. And that's fundamentally wrong. Now, Hammer and Hale do not substantively address whether Ryan is dispensable or indispensable, but there's nothing in the record to suggest he is dispensable. And the reason is, his judgment, where he's owed $600,000, if this garnishment judgment goes through, he will now only be owed $300,000, yet he didn't receive anything. His rights will be substantively effective, uh, affected in his absence. Won't he have a right against uh, the other two if they receive the money? That's not the same as being a judgment creditor, Your Honor. Right now, Nolan Ryan is a judgment creditor. He's owed $600,000. Did he officially uh, intervene in the action below? It, he objected in the basis of the action below. So the statutory garnishment procedure is actually, according to the case law, a separate proceeding. It's its entire own separate civil proceeding. But he, he, but he became a party in essence. When he found out about it, not because Hammer and Hale told him, but because Henry actually informed him that this had happened. Well, how how is he prejudiced by coming to the case late? He's prejudiced because now his name is not on that garnishment judgment. He, he, he is not going to receive the funds. All he seeks is to be treated equally with his other co-judgment creditors. Or can you file his own government uh, 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 garnishment action? He, that's what he sought to do. So here, here's what Nolan Ryan objected to. He said, I should be treated equally with my other co-judgment creditors. If there's a garnishment judgment that's going to be entered, I need to be a part of it. Because if not, then my rights are affected in my absence. And what Commissioner Garbarino ruled, what the trial court said is, the rules of civil procedure don't apply to garnishment actions. Commissioner Garbarino didn't say Nolan Ryan is dispensable, or he didn't find he's not an indispensable party. Do you you have authority, counsel, uh, that a garnishment action is not appropriate unless all interested parties, what you would call indispensable parties, are are joined? I yeah. mean, in a statute or a, a case other than a, a Fifth Circuit case from the 60s? Your Honor, yes. The, the authority is actually not a statute. 
it's not a case it's the rule so there's there's two cases that are on point here about applying the rules of civil procedure in a garnishment proceeding the first one is an arizona supreme court case and that's the davis chilson case in davis chilson the arizona supreme court found that a garnishment judgment was void for failure to comply with a rule of civil procedure it was 1934 case it was then rule seven the arizona supreme court said that garnishment judgment that was entered as void because the rules of civil procedure were not applied with what what about okay so is there a case interpreting the rule that you're talking about in the context of a garnishment and indispensable party uh the answer to that question is despite all the fine lawyers involved in this case nobody has found this fact pattern in any case and and here's the reason why imagine your honors that there's a hundred judgment creditors unapportioned judgment and they're all owed a million dollars one of those judgment creditors only owed one dollar under the judgment but because that judgment creditor is the first one to win the race to the courthouse on his own file an application for rid of garnishment without joining the co-judgment creditors hammer and hale's position would lead to the absurd result that that one judgment creditor gets the whole million dollars first thereby satisfying the judgment as far as the debtor is concerned they're off the hook they paid the million dollars well so what when that absurd result have been challenged at some point in the history of our common law or since this rule was adopted we would think we would think it would but instead we have a rule that actually adopts the the common law rule of equity that in rule 19 is really an adoption of the cardinal rule of equity that you cannot affect somebody's rights in their absence so let's broaden it nationally let's look at every jurisdiction that has this same rule of civil procedure have you found a case that has interpreted that rule to require all interested parties or judgment creditors uh be joined in a garnishment action uh as indispensable parties the answer to that question is there's no case either way there's no case that says one judgment creditor can go collect the full amount notwithstanding his co-judgment creditors also having that same interest in those proceeds well i'm rather confused if you had the answer case where you you had the uh creditor was owed one dollar among a much larger amount if he collected the whole uh, uh amount the other judgment creditors would certainly have have the the right to take their appropriate portion of that from him and the, the remedy and that point would not be against the debtor since the debtor paid his debt but uh, but against the other uh creditor who who was for to use the common in the common phrase unjustly uh enriched and so your honor uh, well i guess if, if that's the case why doesn't your client have a re- re- remedy against the other uh creditors? i understand they may not be what you prefer but how are you in a worse position it's a much worse position because in that context the the person who only owed one dollar who took the million dollars may not have it anymore may have already spent it right now we know there's three hundred thousand dollars that should go to all the judgment creditors and really at the core of our request we're asking for the apportionment to take place first for the decision as to whose money does this belong to to be decided before it is distributed for ryan p and tm and hammer and hail the four co-judgment creditors to all be named on the garnishment judgment because having a garnishment judgment with those funds right there available to satisfy ryan's rights under the judgment is much greater right a much stronger right than a new claim that would require a new lawsuit to go chase new people and then get a judgment against those people well we have to start over no uh uh creditor is is ever guaranteed that someone who owes owes the money actually has the, the money so as long as they get an enforceable judgment then that's just the way their 
rule works. We already, Nolan Ryan already has an enforceable judgment. Nolan Ryan already has an interest in those proceeds. It's, and the reason this fact pattern hasn't come up is because when you're co-judgment creditors, you typically don't, in secret, go try to collect on the judgment without informing the other judgment creditors that's what you're doing. Nolan Ryan, as the first name judgment creditor, has as much of an interest in these proceeds and having this judgment be satisfied as his co-judgment creditors. And all he's asking is, let's have everybody be treated the same. When the money comes in, it goes to all the judgment creditors until it's apportioned. Once it's apportioned, then we find out who gets what. But the, the interesting thing about Hammer and Hill, what's very telling about this, is Hammer and Hill are insisting, let us take the money first, and then we'll decide apportionment later. Obviously not confident in what the apportionment will reveal. Now, let, let's take a step back and look at what the trial court did. The trial court, one, said that the rules of civil procedure, seemingly, don't apply because there was no analysis under Rule 19, and we know that's wrong as a matter of law. There should be an analysis governed as to whether or not a judgment creditor, a co-judgment creditor, is an indispensable party to a garnishment on his judgment? And I think the answer is indisputably yes to that question. So he should have been joined in the failure to join him, just like in the Davis v. Chilson case and just like in the Grote v. Equity case. Is there anything, excuse me for interrupting, but we're starting to run short of time here a little bit. Is there anything in the, the garnishment statutes that supports your position? Absolutely, Your Honor. The, the garnishment statutes provide that a trial court, upon a finding of good cause, can continue or stay a garnishment proceeding. And that's exactly what we have here. Now, the trial court. The good cause being the, the pending arbitration proceeding? That's one of the, one of the factors that we consider as, as supporting a finding of good cause here. But the interesting thing, for your honors, is the commissioner found that his authority was narrower than that which the statute provides. The commissioner indicated in his minute entry and during oral argument that what made the most sense, what was the most practical, is decide who this money belongs to before we start distributing it. But he said his hands were tied, and he couldn't consider, one, the pending arbitration that everybody agrees is taking place. That what is the status of that? Is that over by now? March of 2019 is the last hearing. Phase one is over. Phase two, the final hearing, is in March of 2019. And that's when this apportionment will be decided. Now, Hammer and Hale don't want the arbitration. Phase two is when? Uh, March of uh, 2020, excuse me, Your Honor. March of 2020, I misspoke. That's, that's when the last hearing takes place uh, in, in the arbitration proceeding. It is a long and complex series of disputes. This is actually the fourth case at this court, at the Court of Appeals, involving these same parties and these same disputes. And there's going to be a couple more, I would envision. There's another one pending right now. The, the point of the matter is this is a very complex, high-volume dispute that we're dealing with. But what we're talking about today is $300,000. So under that statute, it seems your argument is it gives the, gives the trial court or the superior court uh, some discretion that, uh, that in this case he felt he didn't have. Your argument is he should have done something. He should have considered a continuance. What, what are your arguments for a continuance? The arguments for a continuance, uh, Your Honor, are one, in, the, in Nolan Ryan's absence, full and effective relief can't be afforded because the, the rule of equity says that if, if granting relief in someone's absence will result in a proliferation of other claims and other lawsuits. That's one of the reasons why you don't allow a judgment to go forward absent giving that person their due process right. So that's one. Because he's not a named judgment creditor, that's, that's enough to, to quash the writ and invalidate it. But as to the continuance, there is a pending arbitration. We're going to apportion. Let me, uh, let me go back to your first point there. Uh, and it relates to something I was starting to ask earlier. Did, did Mr. Ryan attempt to intervene as a party? That was the whole basis of his objection. The whole basis of his objection was, I wasn't joined to this. I wasn't named to this garnishment I'm judgment. I'm not sure you're answering my question. Did he ask to be added as a party? He, he did, because in the objection and during all our argument, and as set forth in our papers, our whole position was, we are an indispensable party to this. Let so me, if we're not let me, added. Let me put it this way. Was a motion to intervene filed with the, attach, with the required attachment of a proposed pleading? It, it, it wasn't, but the, the, the statutory framework for a garnishment doesn't allow a, a, a new complaint to be filed within the statute. The statute only allows an application for writ of garnishment by the judgment creditor against the judgment debtor a debtor, and then the proceedings. And so Nolan Ryan could have filed an application for leave to intervene 
in that case arguing i'm an indispensable party i need to be made a party to this judgment that was in essence what we said in our objection our objection was under rule nineteen this shouldn't go forward because we weren't joined and that was fatal to it now the different to say the proceedings shouldn't go forward because we're in this principle party and you say please add us so that this can go forward and that's all we're asking for that's all our objection says that's all we're asking for in our relief because if the if the garnishment judgment is in favor of all four judgment creditors then this issue is resolved and that's the way it should be and so that is that's what we've been asking for i would like to reserve uh the rest of my time for rebuttal your honors sure they can cancel Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is Wade Bergeson. I am counsel for Appalese, Timothy Hammer, and uh, Mark Hale. Uh, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I want to address a couple of things that counsel just said. I think they go to the heart of the issue, and, and, and frankly, I was, I was kind of surprised to, to hear them. Uh, according to counsel, appellant seeks, his main concern is he won't get his share of 300000 actually $310,000 that are subject to the garnishment. All he seeks is to be treated equally. In, in point of fact, that's not what he seeks because he was at all times going to be treated equally. The hearing transcripts from June 18th of 18 and August 20th of 18 are replete with references from counsel that says the appellants, or I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the, the judgment creditors, there was four of them, three of them had applied for the writ of garnishment, Hammer, Hale, PN, TN, at all times acknowledge that appellant Ryan has an interest in these very funds. Now, if the concern was, well, I'm owed $600,000 today, if the court allows the garnishment for $300,000, <clears> then tomorrow I'm only going to be owed $300,000. It assumes a couple of things that don't exist. One, that Mr. Ryan himself is owed the entirety of the $600,000. He's not. And, and two, that he's not going to share in a portion of those garnished funds. If, in fact, Hammer and Hale's intent had been to, as, as Mr. Callahan described it, go around behind the back of their co-judgment creditor and secretively garnish funds, then why on earth would they have ever named as a, a co-applicant in the garnishment proceeding PMTM? The, the majority member of PMTM has at all times been appellant Ryan. At all. So, uh, counsel, w why wasn't uh, <clears throat> Mr. Ryan invited, I mean, not invited, but uh, why, why wasn't he there uh, to, to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a party to this garnishment proceeding? Why, why was he uh, the, the one left out uh, if, if you concede that he has a right to that amount of funds? I, I must concede that point, Your Honor, that because it was conceded at the at the trial court level and it was conceded in the answering brief. But we don't have to speculate on why Mr. Ryan wasn't included. We have crystal clarity on that issue. If we go to page six of the, the hearing transcript for uh, June 18th, uh, Mr. Cool, James Cool, counsel for the judgment debtor, told us why. If we go to page 24, and I believe also page nine of the uh, um, June, or I'm sorry, the, the August 20th transcript, we, we have the answer. In June, Mr. Cool says to the court, Your Honor, said uh, uh, at some point after the fee judgment had been entered against the judgment debtor in favor of all four judgment creditors, Appellant Ryan did a deal with judgment creditor Henry, pursuant to which uh, Appellant Ryan acquired judgment creditor's interest in PNTM and as part of that agreement, this very judgment is considered extinguished. In August, after a two-month continuance of the garnishment hearing, let's not pretend that a continuance wasn't granted. It was for two months, two months and two days. And during that period of time, Mr. Ryan filed a written objection to the garnishment. At the August, I'm sorry, the August uh, 20 hearing, <clears throat> at page 24, uh, Mr. Ryan's counsel, uh, Mr. Callahan, aptly confirmed to, to uh, Commissioner Garbarino that in fact there was an agreement and this judgment satisfied. 
Now, you, know, you think of the absurdity for that for a moment. We have one judgment creditor that went behind the back of his co-judgment creditors, did a side deal with the judgment debtor to acquire that person's interest in the entity judgment creditor and say, you know what, we're going to consider that fee judgment of $651,000. We'll just consider that satisfied or extinguished. Let's, as, let's... As, as to, as to R R R Ryan. As to everybody. That was the representation at the trial court. Ryan acquires Henry's interest in PNTM, mm -hmm. and as part of that agreement, this fee judgment of 651000 plus will be considered extinguished or satisfied. Uh, it not but just that's, as that's, that's simply not the case, is it? Of course it's not the case. It can't be the case. He had no, no authority or right to extinguish or satisfy a judgment on behalf of the other three judgment creditors. But it does provide some clarity as to why we're here. So what I find interesting is when the argument is all we want is to be treated equally, all we want is to have our share, that's not all they want. What they want is, well, they've told us what they want. They want to quash the garnishment. They don't want there to be any garnishment whatsoever because that judgment, that fee judgment, pursuant to the other side agreement between uh, um, Henry and Ryan, is considered extinguished. He was never going to collect on that. So, Your Honor, when you ask, why wasn't he joined? Because he would never have joined. He already had his secretive side deal with judgment creditor Henry. Let's use counsel's. But you would even. I mean, I assume you'd argue there's no duty to to do anything more than the statute requires, which is to provide notice of a garnishment proceeding, uh, rather than an invitation to join the caption. Oh, it, it, exactly, Your Honor. And, and, and that's actually where I was going to go next. But first, if, if the, the court would, would indulge me for a moment, let's use Mr. Callahan's hypothetical. A hundred judgment creditors, he would like the court to imagine one judgment creditor going behind the back of the, of the rest of the 99 body of judgment creditors and doing a secret garnishment. Imagine the scenario where one judgment creditor of the hundred, where a hundred are owed a million dollars, one judgment creditor goes behind the back of the other 99 and says to the judgment debtor, Tell you what, you owe this group a, a million dollars. Pay me fifty. I'll never join in any garnishment actions of the other the other judgment creditors, and thereby effectively block you. That's just not the statute, which goes directly to your question. What what is the requirement? As as uh, Bennett Bloom tells us, that that there is no such thing as a garnishment in common law. It's entirely a creature of statute, and therefore it's governed entirely by the garnishment statutes. So. What we have here, and, and it goes directly to the issue of did the, the trial court, did Commissioner Garbarino have the, the discretion, the authority to grant a stay? Uh, the answer to that is no, because there is no such discretion or authority in the garnishment statutes themselves. How, the, how about the good cause sentence in, in 15? 1580B, Your Honor? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about 1580B. What 1580B says is that uh, uh, the court is to conduct a hearing within five days of receipt of an objection to a garnishment and a request for hearing. Can, can, if, if there's a, a request for continuance, then, then for good cause, can, can push out that hearing, but in no event to later than 10 days after the request for a hearing, unless the request for continuance is, is brought by the judgment debtor. Okay? So the, the, the focus there is what are the judgment debtor's objections to the garnishment? That's 1580B. And again, let's go back to what I said a little bit ago. Let's don't pretend that there wasn't a continuance. So we have the, the objection by, by uh, the judgment debtor. That objection is to uh, on two bases, but they both go to exemption of funds. That a portion of the funds garnished from, I think, Baird Private Wealth Management were re a retirement account. That the, with BMO Harris, there is the statutory exemption for bank accounts. That was, that was the judgment debtor's objection. Pursuant to a stipulation between the parties, the retirement account was carved out, the bank account ex uh, uh, exemption amount was carved out, taken care of at the June hearing. So why on earth would there have been a two-month and two-day postponement to have another hearing? Because Commissioner Garbarino says, well, we have uh, 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 Judgment Creditor Ryan here that's objecting. Have you filed a, a written objection? Well, no, we haven't. They didn't tell us about it. We just found out, okay, well, I'll tell you what. We'll give you some time. Go ahead and object. 
two months, two days later, they held a hearing. At the August hearing, the sole issue before the court was Appellant Ryan's objection. So let's step back again and see if we complied with the statutes, because, because in point of fact, we did. And then we'll loop in uh, 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 rules of civil procedure 17 and 19, <clears throat> because they, one, there's no statutory uh, uh, applicability or case law applicability, but even if there was, they were complied with. So it, under the garnishment statutes, absolutely nothing in those statutes says that all judgment creditors have to agree to a, an enforcement action before that enforcement, enforcement action can be taken. Doesn't happen, it's not in there. Uh, under uh, 121572, a writ of garnishment will issue when a judgment creditor submits a written application, we have that, and asserts that the garnishee is believed to be in possession of, of it's a number of things, in this case the relevant one is monies that are, that are non-exempt and not, not earnings. So we have, we have that. You cannot look at 121580B in isolation. You must look at that in relation to the other garnishment statutes. The one that they don't mention is the one that takes away all the discretion from Commissioner Garbarino, and that is uh, 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 ARS 121584B. And what that statute tells us very clearly is the mandatory aspect here that's important. And what it says is that if there is an objection, what the court will do is set a hearing, conduct a hearing, listen to argument, to make the following determinations. Was the writ valid against the judgment debtor? In this case, it was. Again, I just went through the, the, the 1572 requirements. Uh, what is the amount of the judgment? There, there's been no dispute about the amount of the fee judgment. <clears throat> That's a non-issue. Third, what is the amount of, if any, of non-exempt monies the garnishee is holding? We had that determination as well. Carved out the retirement funds, carved out the, the statutory bank account funds. That's the last thing. So we have valid writ properly issued. We have amount of fee judgment. We have amount that garnishee is holding. And here, in this case, two garnishees are holding of non-exempt funds that are not earnings. Then the, the, the mandatory aspect kicks in, and it says that once making those findings, the court shall issue a judgment on the writ against the garnishee in that amount. So can, let, let me ask you, just sort of, without getting into those uh, additional points, does the superior court have the word that the court used was discretion to enter uh, a continuance? J just that question, without sort of explaining whether it's more than 10 days and, and who's asking sure. for it. As a, as a matter of the law that's on an exam, true or false, does the court have discretion to enter a continuance under 12-1580? Under 12-1580B, the answer is yes and no. So yes, the court does have the discretion to, to continue for a good cause. If the continuance, if it's past 10 days, is at the request of the judgment debtor, but only to get to the, 50, the, the, the 12, 15, 84 B determinations. Once the court can determine, is the, is the writ properly issued against the judgment debtor? What is the amount of the, of the judgment itself? And what are the amounts of the non-exempt? Uh, how, how do we know that this, I mean, it seems like you're adding to 1580 B, this, that the, the continuance could only be granted to get to the 1584 uh, considerations. How, how do we know that from the sentence in 1580B? The way that sentence ends. So it says, in, you know, past 10 days unless the request for continuance is made by the judgment debtor. Because again, the focus is on the judgment debtor's rights. And, and what the are record the record here, was, wasn't there a request for, a, for the continuance by the judgment debtor? Th there was. But the judgment debtor's objection had already been fully resolved, not by, by Commissioner Garbarino, but by stipulation. Again, their only objection was you have so captured exempt funds. After they took out the exempt funds, yes. that the Henry's then said, well, we have no objection to, to the proceeding. I think the Henry's, as I understand it, probably did join in the request for a continuance, but to what end? But because doesn't, doesn't the fact that if they did join, to seek to be on record as, as 
seeking a continuance, doesn't that trigger the application of 1580B? I don't think in this case under these circumstances it does, Your Honor, and here's why. Because to do that would render 1584B nonsensical. So what would be the point of the continuance? And again, we have to look solely to the statute. So we've got 1570 to 1597. Solely to the statute. Is there any authority in that statutory framework set out by our legislature that allows a continuance, a stay? And it wasn't just a continuance. Let's be honest about it. It was a stay into the indefinite future. And again, I'm alarmed by what I hear today. Keep in mind, on August 20th, Commissioner 2018, Commissioner Garbarino says, well, when will we have that final arbitration award? 60 days. 60 days from today. That would have been roughly August 20, 2018. We're now a full year past that date. We're 14 months past that date from the time it was articulated in court on August 20. And the final arbitration hearing is not even set until March 20. And as I understand counsel's comments, there may be a couple more hearings after that because it's very complicated. When are we ever going to get to that apportionment issue? And also, to the extent that we're concerned at all about this separate private arbitration proceeding, I don't know, and more important, you can't know, that the apportionment issue is even going to be addressed at that arbitration. Now, why don't you know that? Because there's nothing in the record that says it will be. If we take the briefing at its word, if we take the comments of counsel at their word, the arbitration is entered into phase two, and that's about Ryan's claim for damages against Hammer and Hale. Okay? There's nothing, we have nothing in front of us that says that one of the issues specifically going to be addressed by the arbitration panel in that case is going to be, of the three individuals, and let's not forget PNT in itself, because that's a judgment creditor as well, of those four judgment creditors, who contributed what amount to the attorney's fees in the underlying case that resulted in the fee judgment and the fee and cost award of $651,000? So, if I could just go back to the continuance and the discretion. At least on the face of 1580B, without looking at related or ancillary statutes, the court did have discretion to grant the continuance here. And is that accurate? Because in the minute entry, I believe that it was, the court determined they lacked the discretion, but my question is, at least on the face of this statute, it doesn't appear to be the case. Your Honor, I think you have to read the minute entry in conjunction with the facts and what actually happened on the ground. Did the court have discretion for a continuance? Yes. And the court exercised that discretion by continuing the hearing to August 20th. But was the court required, well, number one, was the court required to continue past that date? Or number two, did the court have any authority to continue past that date? And I think the answer to that is, based on the statute, no. Because by August 20th of 2018, the court had already fully resolved the objection of the judgment debtor. The only thing left unresolved and the only issue of the August 20 hearing was what was the other co-judgment creditor's objection that was addressed. Now, I would have argued, I wasn't there, I would have argued on June 18th that the court did not have the discretion. After the resolution by stipulation of the judgment debtor's objection, the judgment debtor having no more objection to the garnishment, I would have argued the court under 121584B no longer had discretion to continue because a continuance at that point, again, would render the rest of the statute nonsensical. What's your quick response to the argument that the rules of civil procedure should apply to the garnishment? That they should or should not? That they should. Your Honor, I haven't seen any statutory or case law support for that position. My quick response to that, and I have to apologize to counsel, I've breached the spirit of our agreement. We had agreed I was going to carve some time out. Rule 17, they brought the action in their own names. Hammer, Henry, and PNTN were judgment creditors. Rule 19, whether there was a formal joinder or not, he was in effect joined. The court could afford complete resolution, complete and final award, even without Ryan, because the entry of the garnishment judgment 
reduce the judgment debtor's obligation to the creditor body as a whole. And Mr. Ryan wasn't prejudiced by that. I apologize, Your Honor. I apologize to counsel. Thank you. Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honors, there is a point that's been overlooked, and it's actually addressed in the supplemental authority that PNTM's counsel filed. Article 6, Sections 1 and 14 of the Arizona Constitution provide the trial court with inherent equitable authorities, and unless expressly displaced by statute, they continue to exist. And that includes the ability to make a finding of good cause, a determination of good cause, and Commissioner Garbarino clearly articulated that his belief was he lacked that discretion. The statute does not so limit him, and the statute does not so displace the inherent authority of our trial courts. He did say that, as I recall, rather straightforwardly, but he also said that the trial court had the discretion because there was a brief two-month continuance. I don't know that we should interpret his ruling as meaning he had never had any discretion for any continuance. The ruling on its face does say that he believed he didn't have the discretion to grant the continuance for the reasons that we had suggested, which includes the pending arbitration and the apportionment and determining who should get this money before it's distributed. But if the ability to grant a continuance is based on the judgment that is objections which have been resolved, then the court wouldn't have discretion other than whatever residual discretion to generate the continuance. The statute actually doesn't require it to be a continuance requested by the judgment debtor. It actually says the court, in considering a continuance, needs to consider two of the judgment debtor's rights. But it doesn't limit it to only those. It just says those must be considered. And the judgment debtor agreed and joined in the request for the continuance, and their counsel is here today, and they still join in and request for a continuance. Now, let's look at one of the arguments that Hammer and Hale made, which is Mullen Ryan tried to satisfy the judgment on his own. He didn't file a satisfaction of judgment. Now, under Hammer and Hale's position, we say it's silly that one judgment creditor can go collect for the rest of the body, and then we deal with sorting out later on who gets what money. Similarly, one judgment creditor shouldn't be able to just file a satisfaction of judgment on behalf of all the other judgment creditors. All parties need to be joined to those proceedings. And there's a lot of discussion about an arbitration. I'm counsel of record in the arbitration. There is an order that defines what the ten claims are that are going to be decided at arbitration. That order was just issued a few weeks ago. I apologize, Your Honor, about a month ago. And so we now know what those claims are. We have the disclosures on it. We're conducting discovery on it. And I'm happy to provide that to Your Honors, but there's actually a much simpler solution. The trial court made a legal error. It too narrowly defined its discretion. This court can remand this case back to the trial court and let it know you have a little bit more authority than you thought you did under the Constitution and under the statutes. You said you weren't exercising discretion because you felt you didn't have it. You do. So have a hearing on it. And we can talk about at the trial court level what is the status of that arbitration. Is the apportionment going to be addressed by March? Is it a claim? And it will be, and we can present all that to the trial court. And after that hearing, the trial court can either say, I am going to exercise my discretion to grant this continuance pending arbitration under the revised Uniform Arbitration Act and the Federal Arbitration Act, or I'm not. I'm deciding not to exercise my discretion pending this arbitration, to continue the proceeding pending the arbitration. But the point is the trial court never made that decision because it felt it was boxed in. And if we were remanded for the trial court to do that, and if the trial court believes in its discretion that a continuance isn't required, then are the judgments properly enforceable at that point? Our position is it would still be legal error because of the failure to include the indispensable party. And so the judgment would still, the garnishment judgment is still invalid because it doesn't include all of the judgment creditors. That would be our position. 
but but the key issue here is let's say that the trial court upon remand says i believe there is good cause for a continuance for the reasons that have all been stated on the record the question is if that was appealed by hammer and hail with this court disturb that finding and find that the trial court abused his discretion i think the answer to that is no and probably vice versa if the trial court holds the hearing and says i don't think there is good cause you despite these incredibly unique circumstances that have never come up apparently in the history of american jurisprudence despite that i don't find there's good cause and i'm not continuing it even though he kind of indicated he thought it made the most sense then that would be appealed for abuse of discretion and i don't think that your honors uh well it's entirely up to your honors but that would be the standard is abuse of discretion right now we're talking about a legal error because he didn't exercise his discretion so all we ask is for a remand to consider all of these factors by the trial court, allow him to make that decision, and then if either party decides to appeal that based on an abuse of discretion standard, then we might be back up here, but I don't think we will. Uh, and if the court has any uh, more questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel. We appreciate your argument uh, today. We'll take this matter under our vice and issue a decision in due course. We're going to stand at, at, at recess for the next case to uh, approach, but we're, we're going to uh, stay put here on the, the bench. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, sure. Mr. Isaacs, could you approach the bench, please?